Yeah, hi. Do you hear me? You hear me? Yes, sounds great. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much, Dustin, for this invitation. I'm so happy to be here today. Um, this, is, this is an event. Well, oh, first of all, I'm Teresa Sorato Pagman. I came from Stockholm University. And uh, uh, this is an event that is organized by the Responsible Learning Analytics SIG, uh, which is a, a group uh, cons consisting of uh, uh, great people from different universities, different countries. We have Olga Bibai from the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden, uh, Simon Knight and uh, Kirsti Kito from the uh, University of Technology in Sydney, Australia. Uh, my colleague Cormac McGrath from Stockholm University, Rebecca Ferguson from uh, the Open University in the UK and uh, Barbara Watson from uh, Bergen University in Norway. And uh, um, let me just go quickly about this, uh, why we have a Responsible Learning Analytics SIG. This is a group that we have created some months ago is because we see the need to have a space uh, uh, where we can foster a research and practice community around issues of responsibility, values in learning analytics, uh, ethics. So uh, we, want, we want to facilitate activities as this one uh, that contribute to discuss how central values uh, how central educational values can be enacted in learning analytics, analytics design uh, and practice. Uh, we are very interested in um, cultivating, nurturing practical reasoning on ethics, responsibility and values. And we hope to serve as a meeting point for researchers working on, on responsible learning analytics to to, to find themselves to and, and to try to identify opportunities for uh, further collaboration and, and funding. Um, we have organized uh, a first workshop at the LAC uh, conference uh, last year. It was about uh, uh, creating just ethical and caring learning analytic systems. And it was really very successful and it was really uh, very interesting to, to start speaking of our responsibility and values with a lot of people uh, coming from the, the community. Uh, then we organized a second one, this time with a focus on design for responsible learning analytics, and that was at ECTEL. And then, um, and it was really very uh, interesting as well. Um, if you are um, interested in, in issues of responsible learning analytics, please. Uh, be involved and help us to, to define, to conceptualize what responsibility in learning analytics is. There are three different links, perhaps Olga can share them in the chat. Uh, so there is information in the Solar uh, website. We have also a website that we, we have created and also contact us by sending us uh, an email and joining the, the Google group that we have. Okay, uh, today we have one hour, so we don't have so much time, but let me just share with you uh, a little bit of background why we are organizing this panel and why uh, we have this SIG. Um, responsible learning analytics is uh, is certainly new, not new, sorry, a new topic for the uh, for the community. From its uh, very beginnings, the learning analytics community has been concerned about the responsible use of tools and has sought to understand the risks and, and potential harms associated with learning analytic practices. Um, there is also, when we look at the use of the term, we find um, that a responsible learning analytics has been used in a book uh, published in 2018 uh, by uh, Ken and colleagues. The book is uh, Responsible Analytics and Data Mining in Education. And there, uh, there is a, specifically a chapter written by Paul Prinslow and Sharon Slade, Mapping Responsible Learning Analytics, a critical proposal where um, we have found a lot of inspiration. Uh, there are many interesting ideas in this chapter, but uh, one of them is uh, that they posit an integrative view of ethics and human responsibility in uh, learning analytics, 
so um, so they talk about re being responsible through uh, throughout these multiple dimensions that constitute uh, learning analytics. So uh, this holistic view, this integrative view, is very interesting for us because uh, we think that. Um, we don't want to um, associate responsibility or, eth or, or ethics uh, with a specific dimension or um, the specific step in the in the life cycle of learning analytics. It's an integrative, is 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 holistic. The other idea is this distinction that they made: uh, being responsible, uh, meaning being accountable, being uh, answerable. Uh, from being responsible, which has to do with this capacity to act, with this capacity to, to intervene, and is connected with this obligation to act, this uh, duty to act. Uh, so those are great um, um, ideas uh, that in, inspire us. Also, um, we think that it's important to, uh, I mean, why we are having this, this panel and why this SIG is because we want also to engage with concrete cases of the ethics of learning analytics systems uh, to cultivate this practical reasoning across the community. We think that it's necessary to, to, to continue to um, to describe what's going on in practice, uh, what what happens when these uh, guidelines or ethical principles are applied, uh, and get inevitably ingrained in social, organizational, political, economic, you name it, intellectual structures designed and regulated by people. Uh, we also think that it's very important to uh, articulate to spell out these values that are uh, taken for granted when we talk about educational values or values in 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 learning um, analytics in the learning and analytics community um so i'm going to stop there uh, this is those are some of the 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 ideas that are um behind um the sig and and this panel and we hope that we can unpack many of these ideas today we have two distinguished speakers and Olga is going to introduce them in a, in a second. I just wanna say that we have one hour. Uh, now, uh, after Olga's um, in introduction presentation of the speakers, uh, we are going to listen to uh, Paul during 10 minutes and then Carrie, and then we will have a discussion that is going to be uh, led by Olga and by me and and then a Q&A session for the audience to ask questions. So um, with that said, I uh, turn to you, Olga. Thank you, and stop sharing here. Thank you, Tessie. And we have 15 minutes left, not one hour. <laughs> so uh, my pleasure is to present two brilliant keynote speakers that we have today. Uh, so firstly, we have Paul Prinsler, who is a research professor in open distance learning uh, in the Department of Business Management and College of Economic and Management Sciences, uh, University of South Africa. He's also a visiting professor at the Karl von Neuseski University of Oldenburg, Germany, and the Research Associate for Contact North in Canada. Uh, Paul is also a fellow of the European Distance and E-Learning Network and serves on the editorial board for many journals. Uh, he's international recognized speaker, scholar and researcher and published a number of articles in the fields of teaching and learning student success in distance education context, ethical collection, analysis of use of student data in learning analytics and also digital identities. Uh, finally, he's born curious and troubled and according to paul suggests that nothing had changed in that so welcome paul thank you so much olga uh, i will share my screen and hopefully everything goes according to plan uh, there's always a number of surprises so let's see um and now i must just go to slideshow and play from the start and hope for the best Thank you so much, Justin, uh, Tessie, and Olga for this opportunity. Uh, it, it's really, really great. And I'm especially privileged to share the stage with Carrie. Um, just some thoughts and some provocations. So uh, in the diagram, you see three, three actors, three main actors, and actually there's four. The first one is the state, and we often forget the state as stakeholder in, in terms of learning analytics. The state determines policy funding, 
legislation, regulation, what an institution can do, what an institution can't do, how it is funded, how programs are funded, and what type of students are enrolled, what are the broad guidelines for admission requirements. So the state impacts in an asymmetrical relationship on institutions as well as on students. Then we have institutions and in the institution, we have to position learning analytics in the, in the context of the institutional character and mandate, where there's a distance education institution, where there's residential, where there's blended, whether it's one of the top tier institutions, whether it's a community college. And we also need to position learning analytics in the context of the infrastructure and the pedagogical and support strategies. And all of these are affected by the funds received from funders as well as from the state, are affected by the regulatory environment determined by the state. So learning analytics is found in the nexus between the state and the institution, but it's also found in the nexus between all three stakeholders where we see students as having constrained agency. They, they are not without responsibility, but they have constrained agency and they have a, a certain amount of self-efficacy and locus of control. But even that then is determined by the degree programs, by it is affected by the amount of support, by pedagogical strategies, by admission requirements determined by the state. So learning analytics and responsible analytics, we must put in the intersection between all three. But then there's a fourth actor that we often forget when we talk about responsible learning analytics, and that's a macro societal impacts on all three actors. And those impacts are outside of the control of the state, and the institution and students. So uh, an event like COVID cannot be the state or the institution or students cannot be held responsible and yet it affects. So talking about responsible and responsible learning analytics, we have to, to consider the context of all three actors and the different asymmetrical relations. So, uh, so it's very important that we never forget these asymmetrical responsibilities differ between these four actors. Then we should not forget the fiduciary and the moral obligations from the state to institutions and to students, from institutions to students and to the state, and the obligations students have to take responsibility for their own learning choices. So um, a point that Sharon, I, as well as Mohammed has constantly made is institutions have a moral obligation to ensure effective learning and learning and analytics fall within that responsibility, but it falls, also falls within the fiduciary obligation required from the state, from institutions. And we should not forget the macro societal impacts that, that impact and have an effect on all of these obligations. So when uh, an institution, for example, doesn't like, get funding or enough funding or uh, copes with, with resource constraints, it impacts then on to how to be responsible to the findings and the data that we receive from our students. Just then the second question is, well, or the third question is, what should we do with all these conceptual frameworks and guides to enable, uh, enable responsible learning analytics? in practice. There, there's a list of conceptual uh, frameworks and there's a list of systematic review on the ethics in learning analytics. So how do we navigate between all of these? And the first icon is we need to critically engage. And I'm, I'm, I'm scared that because of the amount of conceptual frameworks, we don't take cognizance of, of what is really out there. We would rather develop our own framework without really engaging with what is already out there. But it's not just engaging and reading, it's critical engagement. We really, we really need to, to engage in a critical manner with what is out there. We need to scrutinize it and we need to further develop what is already out there. The second icon in the middle is Considering all these conceptual frameworks and ethical frameworks and guidelines, we need to formulate context appropriate responses and frameworks and implement them. So I'm, I'm str I strongly believe that 
that context is everything. What, what works in the US or in Stockholm or in Australia doesn't necessarily work in South Africa or translate or transfer between a residential institution to a distance education institution. We differently funded, we have different mandates, we're in different geopolitical locations. So that's the second, what should we do with these conceptual frameworks? Formulate a context appropriate response. And then the, the other one that is increasingly of concern is to, to determine, okay, now we have the conceptual framework, we have a context appropriate response, but who will have oversight? What will be the governance with regard to the implementation of learning analytics? And then we need to do research. We need to disseminate findings and lessons and then close the feedback to the left to allow for more critical engagement, scrutiny and further development. Uh, the, uh, the next question provided by the committee or the organizing committee was what are the challenges? And I just want to mention a number I really think in the context of South Africa and Africa in the broader context of Africa and possibly the global South is the institutional mandate, the buy-in and then the political support or sponsorship. Often uh, institutions in the global South uh, face so many challenges that learning analytics is just another one, another opportunity and it often disappears. So we really need institutional mandate and buy-in and political support. And political report, uh, support, I refer to institution political. But then the role of sponsors, and uh, that often happens the moment the sponsor leaves or retires or resigns, uh, then the whole project collapse. So, so that's a big challenge is how do we embed learning analytics in higher education practice relying on the sponsorship, but not being over-reliant. The second challenge that most institutions face is data are scattered in different places, in different formats, with different access and governance regimes. It's all over the places. There's data in library, there's data in student admissions, in assignments, in student support, in student counseling. And the data doesn't talk to one another and are in different formats. So what is the role of data warehouses or infrastructure in determining effective and responsible and responsible learning analytics. The third challenge, I, I still believe students are left out of the loop and are often only seen as data subjects and not as owners of their data and even interpreters of the data. We assume we know, uh, we assume that the data presents their whole life and is it crucial that we engage ways to, or find ways to engage students? Then access to data, because it's scattered, uh, because it's all over, and because there's different governance regimes governing all these different types of access, access to data and analysis often is a problem for an academic or a staff support, student support staff member who wants to really use learning analytics. Then there's the issue that is one of my pet projects is the idea of broken data and zombie categories. Many of the categories we use in learning analysis are really zombie. They had meaning at one stage, but what does being married, what is uh, being married or being single mean? What does household mean? In the African context, household is temporal. It can include at one stage 17 people and other times five people. So when we ask students what, how many members in your household, what do we mean? So that's a zombie category. And then broken data refers to when we then gather data, we, we clean the data, we, we reject the noise, we, we clean the data to get rid of the noise, but the noise are data, is data. So what happens if we flatten data and what, what happens and how do we make sense of this reductionist approach? Then data analysis and interpretation expertise are a, a serious challenge in, challenge in many institutions. Um, and then the belief that more data is better, or oh, let's gather more, let's go multimodal, let's go, let's also track them on their phones, let's also track their eye, try, eye movement, oh, and then there's emotions, and oh, there's body temperature, and so the belief that more data is better, that's for me a real, real challenge, and I really want to confront that. And then finally, the ethical oversight is a huge concern. I'm wrapping up. 
colleagues is what is the role of context? Context is everything, everything. And then I refer to macro societal context, geopolitical context, institutional context, but also the context of student habitus and, and, and their learning context. So we have to see student data as entangled in this context. And then when we clean and cook the data, we, we lose context. It becomes blips on our screens with, without the context of how many people in the household or the area in which our students stay. So that brings me to this slide. So I, I'm concerned that learning analytics in its reduction of and in its cleaning of data, we have our scatter plot charts, we have our, our graphs, and we miss the heartbeat, we miss the student, we miss the data that are entangled in a specific context. And then the final question was and is, what could shoot a research agenda? Uh, I would propose a greater legitimacy and support for qualitative ethnographic research on student journeys. There's a preponderance of quantitative analysis, quantitative work in learning analytics. And what about the qualitative? And how do we validate that? I really want to propose that critical data studies should be key to learning analytics. We should not be seen as enemies and not of the core tribe. And then I, this was quote by Kian is, is for me very, very significant where, where criticism is when there's something wrong, when we point out the wrongness and we unmask in order to judge while critique brings an ethical dimension to bear and aspires less to unmask falsehood than to compel his audience to see matters in a different, but not necessarily true or light. Um, then students as core stakeholders, student data sovereignty, giving them options to opt out under what conditions, what are the implications for the institution as well as so students. For me, that's a research area that needs uh, um, research. And then platform ca capitalism, what I call the unholy alliance between platform providers, data brokers and learning analytics. We need to follow the money. Uh, for me, that's a huge concern in learning analytics and that is at the moment absent on, on the, in the learning analytics research agenda. But then also we need to document the successes and the lessons learned in learning analytics. This is not, not, not to, to say there are no successes, but we need to document them. We need to disseminate the findings and celebrate them. And that's my contact details. Thank you. I hope I didn't steal Carrie's time. Thank you, Olga. I'm stopping sharing. Thank you, Paul. And we save the questions for after the presentation of uh, Kerry. So those of you who would like to drop the questions in the chat, please do. But we will also have some space to speak out. <laughs> so feel free to drop the questions or prepare for later discussions. So now it's my pleasure to present uh, Dr. Kerry Klein, who is a senior policy analyst in State High Education Executive Officers Association, CHEO. Uh, in her role, she contributes to the <clears throat> association efforts to develop state post-secondary data system, uh, research and resources, and also provides technical assistance and professional development to the agency, uh, researchers and also policy analysts. Uh, she also collaborates with members and partner organizations to advance the responsible, equitable use of data in post-secondary policy and practice. And her recent research projects are focused on generating a better understanding of the influences of analytics and surveillance technologies in higher education organization and individual decision making, also policy making outcomes and equity. Uh, she is an affiliate also faculty member and graduate of George Mason University in higher education program and she where she teaches classes on higher education administration organization and student affairs administration. Uh, Outside the work, she is a yoga instructor. She loves to read, to travel, and to paddle. Uh, and Carrie is going to talk about uh, drawing on the principle of privacy of design, data justice, and data equity in the US, institutional state policy and practice. She will discuss the ways in, will, in which responsible approaches can be interwoven into the design, implementation, and use of AR and learning analytics data in technologies. So welcome. and. Uh, the floor is your carry. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. And are you seeing my presentation screen, not my notes screen? Just want to double check. So we're all, we're all set. Great. 
Well, thanks. I just want to say thanks so much, Olga, for that, that nice intro and for Tessie and Justin for organizing this as well. And Paul, back at you. Um, it's a privilege to be alongside you. And I, a personal thanks to Paul, who was instrumental in um, his research that he's done with Sharon and on his own um, and in meeting with me when I was in my PhD program um, and in uh, helping me with um, thinking through aspects of my dissertation. So thanks, Paul. Um, I just want to say ditto to everything that Paul said in his talk. Um, and I'll be talking some of the things I'll talk about will interweave with that. Um, I currently work, um, as Ogle said, as a senior policy analyst at SHEO. So I'm working with folks who are working at state level post-secondary data systems and with post-secondary data and who often are working with data that are um, uh, tied and connected to state longitudinal data systems. And eventually in the United States, we're working toward a federal student level data set. So, we're talking about data that's tracking folks from one, one state's calls from cradle to career, and there are some implications of that, 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 that title. Um, but, but the work that I do is to really encourage responsible and equitable use of data uh, within those systems. Um, talking a little bit today about sort of defining responsibility um, and ways to go about doing that and thinking about responsibility and then the flip side of that individual rights um, and some recommendations for research and practice. So one of the challenges is what does responsibility mean, right? What is responsible? And like Paul was saying, it's really contextual. Where you come from, who you are matters and how you're defining um, uh, what responsible is. Oftentimes it's a gut feeling or you have a sense of what is a responsible approach, um, but certainly it's, it is informed by all of those principles and guides that we've come across. Um, a lot of the work that Paul's done around ethics and care um, issues of privacy, of justice and equity. Um, and because um, information is so siloed in higher education, it's really important to find a through line there. And I'm gonna talk a bit about today about how privacy, justice and equity in particular can be a through line and a common connector with groups from, from folks from those different groups that Paul mentioned from the in state, from the institution and from and for the student. Um, and to dealing with some of those larger societal constructions and systems. Um, so why does this matter, right? Well, we all know we have a rapid ability to collect, advancing ability to collect and use data, especially individual personal identifiable data about students. Um, it has the potential to inform practice, so it's become really valuable to institutions to inform their work, really invaluable to states to show that they're doing what they say they're going to do so that their stakeholders, their, the public, can feel like what they're spending their money on and investing on, especially as the price of higher education in the United States here skyrockets, um, that it's worth it, right, that higher education is worth it. Um, but there's also at the same time this growing interest in response to privacy threats and data breaches. If we think about Facebook's data breach with Cambridge Analytica a while ago um, and violations of privacy or in higher education, there have been a lot of data breaches. So there are concerns about sort of, hey, how's my data being used? And that's emerging. Um, and alongside that emerging laws like GDPR and regulations, GDPR in EU countries, there's a patchwork of privacy laws here in the States and sort of wherever you're coming from, there's likely some sort of law or regulation that is attached to how data should be secured and how your privacy should be, be sorted. And I'll talk about why that's important in a minute as a through line. Um, there's also greater potential for harm, especially for folks from marginalized groups. So digital redlining, which Jilliard and Kalik have talked about in the past, um, these data can be recombined, repurposed. It's tied to power dynamics at play. And there's a natural power dynamic that exists in higher education between the institution and the student, between the state and the institution, between the state and the individual. Um, and so, and there's also, uh, per Paul, <laughs> this notion of a duty for care for students. We have a duty of care in higher education for our students, and that should extend, as he argues, to use of their data. So, Responsibility matters. Figuring out what responsibility is, I think, is one of the big challenges. And a way to do that, I think a, a way into that is thinking about data privacy, because there are legal underpinnings and requirements for data privacy that exist. So I, that's why I start there, because wherever you are, as I said, you have some sort of law or regulation sort of overseeing this. Um, and there's likely some sort of legal groundwork to sort of come across and reach across that aisle, get across that silo to communicate with the state actor and institutional actor to be communicating with students. And you can use privacy as that through line. So like with responsibility, privacy is also entirely contextual and how we define it. 
but generally, um, the International Association of Privacy Professionals, this is how they're talking about privacy when it comes to data and information. It's a little different from security. We're talking about how your PII is used and governed, and that's governed by individuals, but also governed by groups within higher education. Privacy typically, oh, and I wanted to say, um, it, it lies in, in that relationship again. Privacy is that piece that lies between the individual and the institution, the individual and the state. And so again, being able to provide a through line, there are, again, once again, more principles, always principles associated with this. These are pretty common. The FIPS principles, have, the FIPS have been around since the 70s is when they started being developed. And they're really useful in thinking about how we should be using data in these systems, how we're governing the use of our data. But they also were the first attempt to start to really think about the individual and the role the individual plays and that the organization or the state should be allowing participation. They should be transparent. They should be limiting that collection of data that Paul was talking about. We don't need to collect everything and we need to, what we're collecting should be for a specific purpose. Really important when thinking about learning analytics data that can be recombined, repurposed, used for future purposes that were completely separate from, from what we originally were thinking about using them. And so how we're communicating that to an individual and what it is we're telling them about how we're using their data now and how their data might be used in the future and what rights and rules they have to be able to interact with that. Again, I didn't mention this, but I shared a link in the chat to this presentation. So I'm gonna go through these slides fairly quickly, um, but we'll talk through some of this, but there are links at the end in the resources to all of the papers associated with what I'm showing today. So you can go there for further reading. So, um, in thinking then about um, FIPS and those principles, um, they do a good job of talking and sort of organizationally about what organizations should do. But in thinking about how you can upstream that privacy into design, into conversations, into collaborations you're having with others, um, the privacy di by design principles, I think, are really useful. They were developed in 2006. So to Paul's point, I think this is one of those things that could be revisited. It would be great to revisit some of the privacy by design principles that are listed here to think about how they can be applied to an evolving environment, data, data environment. But basically the idea of principle by design is that you're embedding privacy at the beginning. It's the default, it's proactive. You're not waiting for something to happen, but you're actually thinking through privacy and the associated organizational responsibilities and hopefully individual rights that are associated with that. So you're thinking through security, you're thinking through functionality, that if you're thinking from a privacy by design perspective, it's positive sum. Everybody should win on the other side. No one should be at a disadvantage, especially our students. And that we're really keeping it user centric, like the student is centered in this process. So while upstreaming data privacy through the design principles really gets at that, that organizational responsibilities and ways to do that early on alongside FIPS, that, that slide I just showed you, really the data justice tenants are more about the rights of the individual. So you'll notice some of the data justice tenants that are listed here. This might be difficult to read, but it's around access to representation, your right to informational privacy, your right to share in the benefits of data, to have choice in how data is used, and to challenge bias or prevent discrimination. And you'll notice there's a lot of alignment here. If you're familiar with the general data protection regulations, GDPR and the EU, a lot of these align with, with what's there because it gets at that, that sort of that coin of institutional responsibility and individual rights and tries to find a better balance between the two. So that power dynamic is, is addressed by finding a balance between the two. And so while that's useful in thinking about it, it doesn't quite get to the how, how do we do all this? Um, how do we make this happen? And so that's tough, right? <laughs> One of the ways, and here's yet another framework, right? Another way for doing things, um, but thinking through the life cycle of, um, of a process, of a data process, building into design, and then moving toward an equity framework. This is really an area that's begun to emerge in the United States right now. I think particularly important, especially given our context. Again, it goes back to context. Um, because of the historic and ongoing racial inequities in our country and how that's, um, and socioeconomic inequities and how that's played out in higher education, access to higher education and outcomes after higher education. 
Um, but this begins to, with the groundwork laid with FIPS and privacy by design and justice tenants, data equity um, allows um, for a way to do this in practice by getting at four really important aspects, most of which Paul talked about. The first was context setting. So that's understanding the differences uh, and nuances for individuals, institutions, states, nations, and their data, right? Um, it gets at this idea of assessment. There's action and assessment involved, and um, that's based on a criticality. So there's a critical sort of thinking through and critique of how data are being collected and used. So you're, you're going through and you're making sure that your processes are inclusive. You're including broad groups of people. You're considering how data might disadvantage different groups or might exclude different groups or, or, or um, disadvantage. Uh, it unintentionally harms specific groups. So you're bringing that sense of criticality. There's a transparency. You're not just including people, you're communicating to what you're doing and you're being inclusive and diverse in your um, collaboration. So you're again, crossing those aisles to bring in groups from beyond just your perspective. Again, to get at that power piece and that power dynamic. I have a couple of examples here that I'll just float through quickly. This is from actually Utah. They began to put together an equity lens for how they use information to inform their policy making and practice. Um, and it's the it goes to the life cycle of the data. They ask a lot of questions. They get to that criticality. They get to inclusiveness. Um, I have a link at the end that I encourage you to look at if, if you're thinking about sort of a process for action. This is really nice work that they've done. When it comes to transparency and communicating with students, this work from University of Michigan, it's their VisiBlue app. They do a lot at communicating with students and how their data is being collected and used at their institution and what the implications are. They even have some videos that they put together to talk about you know, how grades and information are used. So they've done a really a lot of great work there um, at Michigan to try to level that sense of agency that Paul was talking about, to pri try to provide students more agency um, more information and more um, involvement in their information and understanding how that's collected by the institution. Uh, some recommendations for practice. Again, this goes back to a lot of the privacy by design principles, but start with privacy, have a vision, advocate for it, work with others to make it happen, make it everyone's job. Make sure those you're working with, you're vetting partners and third party vendors and apps to make sure that they're on board with how um, you should be approaching this information. And then make those connections. State policy people would love to, at least here, would love to talk to institutional members, to faculty members, to figure out a way to improve systems and structures to make sure that they're centering issues of fairness, of responsibility, of equity, of justice. Um, uh, build it into curriculum and practice. Like Paul was saying, we need to have more curriculum and more bridging between social and computer sciences. It'd be awesome if we could house them all in one spot. I think there was an article in AEM about that a few a couple years ago, um, but being transparent and, and tailoring messages um, and going through assessments, ask yourself those questions. Um, am I, you know, interrogate your assumptions and your biases. Um, and you can do that through some of the questions I've listed here. Um, I am over my time. So I'll just say resources and references and thanks again. And there's my information. Thank you so much, Carrie, and thank you so much, Paul. I think we have some questions. Um, uh, Paul, you have started with the question about the responsibility gap in education, what it is, uh, but we also know that the notion of responsibility gap is not really new. Uh, it uh, was originally introduced uh, for, for almost 20 years ago by Andreas Matthias, and uh, in a philosophical debate, debate to indicate a concern that learning out of matter in, in relation to artificial intelligence, which is emerging in learning analytics research today, may make more difficult or even impossible to attribute moral culpability for personas towards unpoverty events. So the responsibility gap today in the philosophical debate is uh, discussed not as one particular problem, but in relation to four intercollective problems, such as culpability, such as moral accountability, public accountability. All the three are kind of passive, passive form of responsibility and also active responsibility, which defines as a duty to promote and achieve certain societal shared goals and values. 
let's say, educational values. So how do the four problems relate to the responsibility gap in the current uh, learning analytics research and context? And what is active responsibility uh, that we have already touched upon? <laughs> so how can we uh, relate the learning analytics research today to these different problems of culpability, moral accountability, public accountability, and also active responsibility? Oh my goodness, that's enough for a thesis, Olga. Um, I'm going to uh, answer in two short statements and please carry help. Um, so, so the first, first thing is we need to think of responsibility as an ecology. Uh, there's increasing the, uh, the, the phenomenon that the state uh, requires higher educations to do more than the state actually resource them to do. So the state has responsibility. We cannot uh, let the state go un untasked in this responsibility. So institutions cannot take more responsibility. Institutions cannot take responsibility to, for providing all kinds of support if they're not funded. So we have to think in terms of an ecology of responsibility. And those four elements that you've mentioned lie in the intersection of all three. So, so I, I really think the four questions, I would love to respond to them in a blog post, uh, Olga, because it's really, I would love to map them all in that nexus between the state, the institution and the, the, the learner or the student and to see, and then the macro societal context to say, where does culpable uh, responsibility lie? Where do all these elements lie? So that's very short from me. So we have to think, about an ecology of responsibility, and then where do the responsibilities and the the privileges lie, and the um, and the obligations lie? So the state has an obligation, institutions have an obligation, students have an obligation, but it's a shared shared obligation. Uh, Carrie, I don't know whether you want to come in there. This was really a hectic question from Olga. Yeah, so I would say I agree. I, I think I, I use the ecosystem of the ecology, yeah, of um, of responsibility. And I think to, to get at it, and, and Cormac had asked a question about, um, you know, the rights of the individual versus the greater good. I think that that's where that ecology perspective is so important, right? Because it is a um, a collective a collective approach that needs to be taken. So everyone has responsibility within that system. Everybody has obligations within that, in that system, and everyone has rights and response rights within that system. And I think to to the question about both from Cormac and later on, I think um, oh, it's both from Cormac um, around the balance between sort of equity versus privacy and where the balance is. I think that's where we need to be figuring out those tensions. But it, the to the extent possible, having that individual or that student perspective as a part of the conversation is important. And typically they're not included. And typically, especially as we think about the broader ecosystem to include at tech vendors, um, the power dynamic is skewed so that um, oftentimes the focus of the work is um, driven by those with the most power, whether that's the institution, the state, the vendor. And um, sometimes that student voice or perspective is not included in that agency. So finding um, a sense in, within the ecosystem that, that, that responsibility and agency and rights are, are balanced, I think is gonna be really important. And it's not easy work, right? It's, it's a tension and again, it's all contextual. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. And I have just a short follow up question. We talk about responsibility in terms of privacy, in terms of security, in terms of anonymity. But I was also thinking uh, responsibility in terms of preserving education values. We have more technologies today coming in the classroom. We have learning aids, we have AI. So usually it's schools, usually it's education institutions who takes care of, you know, kind of communicating the values, the site of education values what happens who will be responsible for <laughs> for the values that usually like communicated by the education institution uh, and I, I think like from my perspective it's a bit uh, also a part of responsibility of the learning analytics community and the growing AR community which is emerging uh, all together so I'm not sure what are your thoughts about this uh, just very shortly Paul and Gary. Yeah 
about education values or site value for school? Uh, Good question, uh, Olga. We cannot abdicate our responsibility. So when we make use of a platform provider, we, it's us that that provides the contract. We, it's us that uh, that signs a contract, and that's increasingly a concern. What values do these platforms bring in? And I just want to 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 leave one comment uh, in response to this question. If Paulo Freire would have designed a learning management system, not that I think he would be comfortable with learning management system, <laughs> but if he would design a, a platform for engagement, what would it look like? So our platforms and our LMSs determines what is measured what is taught, how it is taught, when it is taught. So, so that's a very, very critical question you ask is, we have a responsibility to maintain a certain set of values and we cannot abdicate our responsibility. Carrie, you? Yeah, so I think this is where it's so important to the extent that um, those working in learning analytics who are committed to responsible learning analytics use really work to, to find connections outside of their institution, whether it's through state actors um, or others to help shift the narrative. So in, for instance, in the United States right now, unfortunately, we have a very sort of loud um, movement uh, that's sort of anti-critical race theory movement, right? That's happening and saying, you know, we shouldn't be including this in, in, in academia at all or K-12 systems, even though it's not taught there, um, but that this should not exist in education. Um, and you know, so anytime that there's that sort of being able to sort of work collaboratively and collectively to push back and to really say, no, these are the values that we're working with, um, whether those are human rights values or anti-discrimination or, you know, whatever those social justice tenets are, um, being able to work through and build partnerships so that we get beyond not just the data silos, but the sort of the the institutional silos that exist and the institution state silos that exist to, to build some of those connections and bridges, I think is, is important. Um, and so who, in your, where you are, whoever is your oversight entity, you know, finding ways to connect with them to talk through, give a talk, provide some information on sort of what work you're doing in this area to advance issues of access and equitable outcomes, I think um, is, is important. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think we should take some questions now. We have more questions, of course, <laughs> but I think we should uh, allow audience if you have any questions to come in. I think uh, um, maybe Cormac had a couple of questions or I think one of them has been answered already. Um, Cormac, do you want to, to speak out maybe? No. Ah, um, Justin, you may probably need to allow. Yes, it is done now. Sorry about that. Yes, I it's kind of turned on. Correct. You? Yeah, thank. No, awesome. thank you very much. No, uh, thank you very much. So uh, I in uh, any I posed a few questions in the chat, and if anything uh, you know strikes a chord or resonates with either Paul or Carrie, then uh, I, I wouldn't want to take any more time. I mean, I'm just happy. I'm happy to listen. So if anything, if anything came up that struck a chord. Um, yeah, so Carmen, I'm just reading your last one and you, where you say equity is not a question on the LA agenda. I think it should be. <laughs> so I would say that's an area maybe to, to explore, um, to start thinking about sort of how, what role data equity plays and in, in what, what the, the connection to equity is to responsible use of data. I can give you an example. I was just having a conversation with, um, uh, national um, uh, group that's trying to, to work with um, post-secondary data. And they had, for the first time, decided to um, disaggregate further gender um, beyond the binary, which was great. And I said, well, what about race and ethnicity? Are we going to further disaggregate that information into sub buckets? So for instance, for Asian Pacific Islanders, are we going to allow for dividing into subgroups or for Hispanic Latino, populations will be able to divide into subgroups so we get a clear picture of what's going on or get some information or so those folks within those groups can be represented um, should they choose <laughs> in systems um, and there was a little bit of hesitancy and I said well if we can do it for gender certainly we can do it for race and ethnicity 
Um, and so I think, again, you know, sort of having that critical lens that Paul was mentioning in his talk as well is a really important area to be moving toward in the use of data, um, to think about um, not just the questions we're asking, but how we're asking them and what assumptions we're making based on that. I don't know if that answers your questions, Mohamed, but. Yeah, yeah no, Paul's again, that, that. it's, uh, you know, thanks for taking the time to answer them. Um, one issue that I brought up is the issue of representation. And I, I wrote the question about data feminism, because that seems to have an entirely different view on uh, representation and uh, and these kinds of questions. So uh, thank you for addressing those issues. Olga, can I come in? Yes, please. Um, Cormac, uh, the, the issue you raise in, in, in your first question is whether we should collect data if we not, if we don't have the resources to act. That's a very, very interesting moral dilemma. Uh, we have a fiduciary duty to ensure effective learning and experiences. So um, part of ensuring effective learning, uh, effective learning experiences is to, to have evidence-informed teaching and learning strategies. So we need the evidence. But then if we see a student is struggling or a cohort or a group of students are struggling and we cannot act, should we have uh, collected the data? For me, that is a very, very interesting dilemma. Uh, and I do think um, it points to the responsibility to be responsible when we collect more and more data and when we define students as vulnerable or as at risk. And then just one short comment about data feminism and critical data studies. From my perspective, it would seem as if critical data studies and the work of Neil Selwyn and, and often Simon Buckingham really don't make inroads into the bigger learning analytics community. There's, there's a critical cohort of research coming from the University of Bergen, but there, other than that, there's not really a lot of critical voices inside the learning analytics community. There's a lot of critical voices outside the formal community. And that raises the issue of maybe there are tribes, but there's only one tribe that determines what is learning analytics and what is acceptable. And that brings me to the point of data feminism. I would love to see learning analytics and data feminism in cohorts with one another to see where that goes. Uh, I almost think data feminism has a more, has a longer, um, longer opportunity life than critical data studies. So that's just my view. Thanks, Olga. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, let's see. It says there is a question from Anne. Uh, in the field of learning analytics, people work in interdisciplinary teams and therefore experts come from different epistemic cultures. Do you see that this can influence on the values that lie behind the intentions to develop, implement the use LA in different contexts and how could that be made visible? Very good question, I think. And uh, I also had similar question in mind. So <laughs> any ideas and thoughts? It's in the chat as well. Carrie, you go first. Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, yes, I think it's valuable. I think it's important to have a diverse team. I worked on when I, the learning analytics work that I did was a team of um, computer scientists and social scientists um, who had more of a sociological um, or higher education uh, folks who had a more of a sociological background. And I do think that that can bring a cognitive complexity to projects that help you see and understand um, questions, assumptions uh, beyond what you maybe would have if it were, you know, just a, a, a group from one discipline. Um, but I do think that that to the point that I was making very quickly toward the end as I blew through my recommendations, I do think that um, that can be useful, but there has to be intentional engagement of conversation around these issues. It can't just be like, we're a diverse group, great, let's do a project. You need to be asking those questions around why are we asking the questions we're asking? What are some of the implications about these questions or the data that we're collecting? And so um, really work to interrogate, um, you know, sort of a meta, from a meta perspective, what it is you're doing and, and so that you'll understand what the implications can be long-term. 
Yeah, Olga, just in, in addition to what uh, Carrie has said, I do think what will be a very interesting analysis to, is to look at learning analytics as field in, a bo in the work of Pierre Bourdieu. And what is a doxa in learning analytics? And if there's, is there space for heterodoxy? Is there space for these different epistemologies? And then considering that, that learning analytics, the, the journal of learning analytics is housed in the discipline of computer science. And the format of the journal articles are, are computer science formats. Uh, so it's very interesting. So it will be a very interesting to analysis to say, what are the rules of this tribe? Who determines the rules? Who are the gatekeepers? Who does this tribe consist of? And what is a dominant doxa, or what is a what is there any heterodoxy in the field of learning analytics? So that's just from my side. Yeah, and I can say I can give an example of that. So some of the articles I was writing from a higher education perspective, disciplinary perspective, for a couple of the computer science journals, they said, "Oh, it's not it's not tech enough, basically." But then I applied to the higher education journals, and I said, "Oh, it's too tech." So you're in this weird middle space, right? So it's it's learning to sort of okay, what's the language? What's what's the what's the the norms of of these groups? And then how do you find you know some common ground? Yeah, excellent questions and and uh, brilliant answers. So um, is um, here in Stockholm is eight uh, fifty eight. So we think that it's time to uh, thank the, uh, the presenters, the speakers, and uh, start wrapping up this panel. And uh, I learned many things uh, today. Um, I learned that responsibility, to uh, think about responsibility, we have to think in terms of this um, interrelationships between the state, the institutions, the students. We have to think about this asymmetrical power relationships. Um, we have to think about um, that students are not only data subjects, they're data owners and co-interpreters. Um, more data is not better. Uh, we need examples hmm, of how these uh, principles, guidelines are enacted in practice. Um, responsibility is contextual, is local. Um, Carrie mentioned this duty of care for the students, uh, this ecology, uh, this ecosystem, when we think about responsibility, we need to think in terms of this um, ecosystem of different actors and different tools uh, that are enmeshed, enmeshed with each other. Um, we also uh, learned about data equity, this equity lens framework, and uh, these other examples mentioned in, in Carrie's presentation. Anything else, uh, Olga, that we learned today? <laughs> we learned a lot, but we have also a lot of questions left. <laughs> but anyway, we also organize uh, another workshop during Learning Analytics Summer Institute in June, if you would like to join our SIG. So we are going to offer an online event on the 13th of June. Uh, where we are continue to talk about responsible learning analytics. So everyone is welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you, especially Paul and Carrie for joining us and all the audience. Um, and thank you, Tessie. Yeah, thank you all. And see you soon again. Thank you, Paul. Thank